think I overwrote an awful lot of stuff. Like what? Well, you know, when I think back on it, I mean, I don't know, things like... Um, Gold, uh, what about Family Affair? Yeah, I mean, it's there's nothing wrong with it, really, uh, except my obscure lyric. My, I mean, the, I used to write lyrics that were so bloody obscure, nobody would ever figure out what the hell I was on about. And what was that about? Well, it was about the Mafia in Las Vegas, but nobody would ever know that <laughs> by listening to it. Um but that came about that thing about it, that was you know the time or had been not long before where people were big into uh, uh, trying to decipher lyrics. I mean the Beatles went through it, you know, LSD, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, you know, is it about drugs and all that crap? So the idea of writing um, um, interesting, if you like, lyrics, obscure lyrics, um, and I think we overdid. I think now looking back on it, that. It would have been. See, it's ridiculous. You can't say it in retrospect, can you? If we'd have kept things simpler, I think we tried to get too overblown on stuff. The tracks, I think, started to get too overblown. The concept of them, you know, not so much the playing, but the concept of them. It's strange that some Rubets records have a very earthy sound to them. Things like "Play the Game," mm. uh, whereas other things like. Uh, Baby I Know or Sometime in Old Church are very um, are produced with a very glossy sound aren't they? Yeah but look how different they are you know Play the Game Sometime in Old Church and Baby I Know what the hell have they got to do with each other? You know they're all very good in their own way you know I always say this you know whether you like the band or not you can't fault the playing or the singing and we did it all I mean there's, you know, there's no session people involved in any of this it was all all our own all my own work governor um, but it's, it, it don't meet anywhere, does it? I mean, if I remember rightly, you're the reason why, and Baby I Know well, came out, like, you're the reason why, and then Baby I Know was the next one, wasn't it? They've got nothing, do you know what I mean? There's no... Consistency? There's, there's no recognisable character t to it. Now, I mean, part of that was down to the mix in the band, but the other part of it was down to the fact that we were getting such a terrible slagging from the press all the time that we were kind of forced to try and find something they might like. And that meant experimenting and trying different things all the time, trying to find your feet. Um, and was we, there any difference in the way they were recorded? No. Baby I Know and Play the Game. Well, Play the Game was different because it was done as a demo in Polydor's own studio. Uh, and when we, we were doing the album at Lansdowne, uh, which was a fabulous studio, um, and when we tried to redo it in Lansdowne, we found that we couldn't play it with the same intensity that we'd played it on the demo. So eventually Wayne said, well, look, let's just use what you did on the demo and we'll just redo the lead vocal so I tried to redo the lead vocal and I couldn't do that either so we ended up using the demo on the album so the demo is on the album yeah and uh, you know it makes you wonder I think you think well what if Polydor Studio worked that well why are we ever doing anything anywhere else I never did figure that out there's a bloke called Carlos Holmes had, had built a studio at Polydor on his own I think and they only ever really used it for demos but so that was it but I mean no everything else was just recorded the way it was recorded you know we played it the way it needed to be played there was no difference in the recording techniques did you learn anything with the Rubettes? everything well people say so what was it like being with the Rubettes? I always say it was like being at university 24 hours a day for four years um, because when you've not been used to doing anything like that Everything comes as a shock. But you'd toured before, though. With with Willie. Yeah. And th this was a different touring experience, I take it. Totally. In what way? Blimey. <laughs> Every way. I mean, Will was a piece of cake. I mean, all we did with Will was, was get in a, a minibus or something with um, all the gear, drive to wherever we were doing, 
set the gear up, play the show every night for a week, or twice a night, which was usual, um, and then pack all the gear on the, the, the minibus and drive up to the next place we were playing for a week. If we were doing tours for the Falses, it was different because we, we did three of them. And that would be a different show every night. But it was still just the question of, you know, you walk, you set your gear up, you walk out, you do your show, you pack it down, you go home. Um, with the Rubets, you're dealing with uh, all the publicity, you're dealing with photo stuff all the time, interviews, masses of bloody gear, road crew, all the stuff that, you know, and obviously playing vastly bigger places. Um, and, I mean, I'd never had any experience of carting my own PA system around. I mean, that, well, I learned I never want to do it again. When you say carting your own PA around, you don't mean lifting it yourself. No, but, you know, going around the world with that thing and realising that you walk on a stage, you've, you've spent a fortune on all this bloody stuff, and you walk on a stage and you can't hear each other. So then you have to start, well, what are we going to do to hear each other? And the performance we went through, and that thing of, you know, somebody... You do a gig, someone comes backstage and you say, all right, you, you enjoy it. He said, yeah, sound was a bit crap. Was it? Yeah. Dave called the sound man in. Uh, what was the sound like out front tonight? Fine. <laughs> well, this fella reckons it sounded shit. No, it was fine. And you haven't got a clue. So you might go on and do a great show, you think, and it sounds shit out front, and you don't know. So a lot of people are using in-ear monitors now um, and get their own private, personal mixes in their ears throughout the show. What do you think of things like that? Well, how do you think you still don't know what it sounds like out front? You haven't got a clue. And then you see, uh, then I, well, I did anyway. Then you start to think, well, um, hang on, I've got the guitar I want and the amp I want. Why would I want to put a mic in front of it and have someone else decide what I sound like? Or how loud I am. You know what I mean? You suddenly think, but well, there's mental in it. Especially if you have no idea what it sounds like out front. Um, but we tried everything. I mean, you know, we, we bought new on, uh, side film monitors and went out and tried those. Still couldn't. I mean, I guess with the in-ear things, you will be able to hear everybody else on stage, I suppose. I've never tried them. Um, but we, we tried that and that didn't work. I mean, because, you know, big stages... And they haven't got to be that big. I mean, you know, big-ish stage sometimes. I remember at Blackburn College once, we did a gig at Blackburn College where Steve Grant was on drums, and Steve Grant was a heavy metal drummer. And our bass tutor, I can't remember his name, he was uh, on bass. There's only three of us. I couldn't hear the bass at all, and he had a big old amp, but I couldn't hear it at all. This wasn't Scott Whitley? No. Um... But he had a big old app and I couldn't hear it. And Steve Grant, I was only standing a matter of a few feet away from him, and it sounded like someone tapping a cardboard box with a comb. You know, it so different for I mean and every venue is like that. So the bigger they are, the more they're like that. Um so we decided we got uh, invited to um or got asked to do a song festival in Sarajevo, I think, or Belgrade, somewhere down there. What used to be Yugoslavia, anyway. Uh, and we said, well, we can't because the gear is on its way back from Scandinavia and the gear, there's no way on God's earth we're going to get the gear from Scandinavia all the way down there in time to do this thing. So they said, well, if we get you some gear, will you come down and do it? So we said, yeah, well, yeah, all right. So we sent them a big list of all the gear we used. The amp I had, Alan's amp, mix amp, everything. And when we get down there, and there was no rehearsal, I mean, the place was already packed with people when we went on. And when we walked onto the stage, there were three Fender Twin Reverbs and a drum kit, nothing we'd asked for. So we went through the usual moaning at each other thing to start with. Bastards, what a fucking, what a fucking read. What's the point of asking what you want if you ain't going to fucking get it? And halfway through the second number, I think, I looked at Nick and he looked at me and I knew what he was thinking. We could hear each other perfectly. It was brilliant. We'd never heard each other like that. 
So when we came off, we said to our manager, right, next time we get to the gig, we're going to do that. Right, We're going to have three amps on the stage, almost in a little semicircle, like we're in a, playing in a, in a club or a pub, drums off the riser on the floor, and that's how we're going to do it. So we got to the next gig, and we tried that, and it sounded great. And he said, are you happy? And we said, yes, fabulous. And he said, okay, Dave, turn the PA system on. And Dave turned the PA system on. The sound came out of the PA system, rolled around the fucking hall, came back over the stage like a wave and drowned out what we were doing. And you well, how can you ever do this, you know? So I ended up, and I used to have, this sounds potty when I say it, but I used to have a wedge monitor that side pointing at that ear so I could hear my vocals. And I used to have a twin reverb in front of me laying back like the monitor with my guitar going in that ear. So I could hear exactly what I was doing. Um, nobody out front, I remember our sound bloke sometimes would say to me, can you turn that guitar down? It's coming too loud off the stage for me to put it through the system. And I used to say, well, if it's coming loud enough off the stage, why put it through the fucking system? <laughs> And eventually I thought, well, the only way I can get around this is don't even point it off the stage, point it at me. So I had me amp that side, wedge monitor that, I could hear what I was playing, I could hear what I was singing, I could make sure I was in tune and everything was right. And I did it like that. 